I get a thumbs up? All right. Uh, can I get a thumbs up that everybody can see my screen and my laser pointer? Excellent. All right. So all the work that goes on in my lab, one way or another, is focused on the origin of novel complex traits in development and evolution. That's about as broad a question as you can make it. So to make that uh, digestible and approachable, we break it down into uh, along seven dimensions of what we call innovation and diversification. And we enlist in that attack a diverse cast of insect model systems. Uh, so for instance, we have done work on fireflies and their light producing organs, the lantern, to explore the very origin of novel complex traits, but also the developmental evolution of size, shape, and positioning, which in these groups has undergone very interesting patterns of diversification. We've done some work on uh, tree hoppers and their extraordinary helmets, where we address some of the same questions, uh, but we also add to it a research program interested in the developmental evolution of sex differences. But we do most of our work on beetles and their horns, where again, we address those same questions I already mentioned, but also explore the origin and diversification of conditional development, environment sensitive development. We explore various aspects in the developmental evolution of phenotypic integration. Complex traits are complex because they often involve the coordinated expression of behavior, morphology, physiology. That coordination is of course an evolved property and can diversify, we want to know how it originates, how it diversifies, how it contributes to organismal diversity on this planet. But we also switch gears and explore innovation through team building, when organisms from different taxa form collectives, symbioses, and as a team manage to adapt and innovate in ways that component taxa cannot. And lastly, we explore innovation for environment engineering, when organisms innovate and adapt to novel circumstances, not just by changing their phenotypes over evolutionary time to suit a particular environmental circumstance, but find ways to change the environment that surrounds them to suit the traits they already possess. So today I hope to give you exemplars of some of the research that goes on in our group that cater to most of these dimensions one way or another. Uh, but before I do any of this, I uh, owe you a justification for why anyone would want to address this using horned beetles. Okay, so it boils down to four major reasons. First, uh, beetle horns are major structures. There's nothing subtle about them. They are, they dominate the phenotype of their bearers, not just morphologically, but also behaviorally, where they function as weapons in male-male combat. Males beat the crap out of each other using horns as weapons. Um, and as a consequence, they dominate or they shape the behavioral ecology of individuals and populations. Beetle horns are also extraordinarily diverse on a variety of levels and for different proximate reasons. Okay, what do I mean by this? Uh, what I'm showing you here in this column are the large male phenotypes of five species that we often maintain in continuous culture in the lab. And you can see that they differ in the number of horns, the shape of horns, the exact location of horns. Uh, and you can look at this diversity as a reflection of evolved, canalized differences between species. All right, in the next column, I'm showing you the corresponding females. And you can see that for the most part, with the exception of this species, they're all essentially hornless, giving rise to large or small sexual dimorphisms, sexual dimorphisms involving the head or the thorax, or in this case here, a, a very enigmatic and unusual reversed sexual dimorphism. And you can look at this diversity as a reflection of canalized differences following XX, XY sex determination. But there's a third column, and this one now shows the phenotypes uh, that small uh, males develop into that as larvae had access to suboptimal feeding conditions. And here you can see that depending on species, we have more or less, uh, or we have more dramatic or less dramatic differences in phenotype expression uh, involving in the head or the thorax, or in this case here, a species that has secondarily lost environment sensitive expression of horns in males. And you can look at this diversity as a reflection of plastic development entirely due to variation in nutritional conditions experienced during development. And in cases in which we get discrete differences 
as in this species where males develop into alternate horned or hornless morphologies, we call this a polyphenism. All right, last but not least, and perhaps most important, beetle horns lack obvious homology to other traits in insects or non-insect arthropods. They are not, at least on the surface, modified legs or antennae or mouth parts. Instead, they exist alongside these traits. We can therefore look at them as an exemplar, as a manifestation of an evolutionary novelty, which ever since its invention has undergone one of the most dramatic trait diversifications in the animal kingdom. All right, so armed with this background knowledge, let's embark on our first two dimensions of innovation and diversification, the very origins to novelty and to developmental evolution of size, shape, and position. And here I wanna focus on the origins of thoracic beetles, beetle horns. So ignore anything that's coming out of the head, focus on what's coming out of the first thoracic segment. And I'm gonna tell you that story in two phases. The first one by, is work by Tammy Cruikshank, a former grad student in the lab, and Andrew Shelby, an undergraduate. And uh, Yong Gong Hu and David Lintz then marked the second phase. Both of them are current postdocs in the lab. All right, so uh, let me set the stage. What I want to impress upon you is that thoracic beetle horns are an example of a striking innovation from the first thoracic segments. So here are uh, six, seven, eight exemplars of thoracic horns that are all spectacular in their own way. I want you to note that they can be singular, they can come in pairs, they can be, uh, there's one that has four that's really unusual. Here are three. Um, the, uh, uh, but the other thing I want to impress upon you that that is that they're just one example of the many types of innovation that you can see emerge from that segment. So here are some others. There can be crazy color patterns. There can be samurai-like shoulder extensions. There can be whatever this is, and then whatever the heck tree hoppers do with their first thoracic segment. So somehow the first thoracic segment seems to be a bit of a hotspot of innovation. Okay. Here's where the story really starts. So this is from a paper by Doug Emlin and colleagues in 2005, published in Evolution, that shows uh, the phylogenetic relationship of 48 species within the genus Ontophagus, the main genus on which we work. Uh, males are shown on your left, females are shown on your right, and colored in green are all those lineages in which we see thoracic horns in extant species. And based on that analysis, this study arrived at the conclusion that the only way you can explain present day patterns of diversification, the most parsimonious explanation requires nine independent gains of thoracic horns in males and seven in females. That's of course an extraordinary claim, but it's entirely backed up by this analysis. Well, um, this analysis was done on adult specimens only. Uh, very quickly, we noticed that, for instance, one of these species here, Ontophagus binotis, which we had in culture, and which is labeled in the phylogeny as having thoracic horns only as males, but not as females. Once we look at one stage earlier in development, the pupa, we see that both males and females make a thoracic horn. It's just females unmake it before they turn into an adult. That was curious. The same is true for Ontophagus hecata up there. Then we discovered Ontophagus taurus, which in this phylogeny is labeled as having no thoracic horns in males nor females. But if you look at the corresponding pupae, of course, males and females both make a thoracic horn. They just now both, there's actually a sexual dimorphism. Males make a much bigger one than females, but they now both unmake it and there's no trace of it in the corresponding adults. The same is true for all those other species highlighted in red right now in this phylogeny. In fact, I identified 22 additional species that are not in this phylogeny, all of him, all of which lack thoracic horns as, adult, as adults, but they all have them as pupae. So clearly, it looks like rather than invoking multiple gains of thoracic horns in males and females, what seems more likely is that thoracic horns originate once at the very base of Ontophagus phylogeny. And what truly diversified is a given lineage's ability to maintain or lose the thoracic horn during late post-embryonic development. 
Right. This, of course, immediately begs the question, why bother? Why would you grow a thoracic horn in late larval development, have it present in pupae just to absorb it into adulthood? What you're looking at here before you turn adult is a late pupa of Anthophagus taurus. And what I would like you to see is that the future adult head horn is shining through the pupal cuticle. Clearly that pupal structure is converted into an adult counterpart, but that is not true for the thoracic horn back here. It's completely empty. The epidermis has fully receded before it is now depositing the thoracic cuticle. So we asked, could these structures possibly have a utility beyond just being the precursor of an adult weapon? Is there something else these structures might do? All right. This is where the answer starts to emerge. So what I'm showing you here is a sagittal section through the head capsule and the first thoracic segment of a larva that is about to turn itself into a pupa. So what is highlighted here in gray and what I'm tracing here with my cursor is the cuticle. Shown in blue is the epidermis. This is the future thoracic horn as it's still folded up underneath, about to expand. And what I would like you to focus on is this tip here. Let's zoom in on it. What this tip is doing is it is inserting itself into the space vacated between the head capsule and the epidermis that has apolized, detached from that head capsule. And if I would have fixed that animal a few hours later, that tip would have now been over here. It's sort of advancing forward. Intriguingly, if you watch an animal molt from larva, this is what the larvae look like, into a pupa, the first thing that emerges from the head is not the head. It is the thoracic horn, which plows through the head, through these preformed suture lines, these areas of weakness, and breaks open the head capsule. At least that is the impression you get. So we had to test this. And uh, what we developed is a method that destroys the precursor shells, cells that give rise to this thoracic horn. And if our hypothesis that the thoracic horn is required for the shedding of the larval half capsule is correct, then two things should happen. We should get pupae that lack a thoracic horn and those that lack a thoracic horn should also have failed to shed their larval head capsule. And that is exactly what happened. You can do this experiment comparatively. <clears throat> well, you can do it first quantitatively. In one species, Antophagus bionotus, one of the derived species in that clade, uh, you can do it for Antophagus uh, gazella, which is a more basally positioned lineage. It is intriguing because it has one of the smallest thoracic horns in both males and females. But when you do the same surgery, you get the exact same effect, failure to shed the larval head capsule. And then we move just outside the genus Antophagus into the sister genus Uniticellus. And when we did that, and I should say, these guys don't have horns on the forex, but they have sort of a certain bumpiness. But of course, you can do the same surgery in the larva. And when you do that, they don't give a damn. They shed their head capsule no matter what. All right. So this was exciting because it suggested to us that prepupal thoracic horns facilitate the shedding of the larval head capsule. And that would explain the maintenance of horn development in larvae, even though so many species no longer express them as adults. It also suggests that this dual function of prepupal horn growth, a shedding device, but also a weapon, appears to be unique or a precursor to a weapon to the genus Antophagus. And it raises the possibility that thoracic horns may have evolved initially as an adaptation to larval pupal development and only secondarily been exapted to become precursors of adult weapons. So we were super excited about this, but also a little dissatisfied because it seems like an explanation that is very idiosyncratic to our beetles. It also raises the question, where do then do pupil horns come from? We just sort of pushed it back one stage in development. Or where did any of the other T1 elaborations come from? It does not seem to be a universally applicable explanation. And so this is where phase two starts. This is work by Yang Gong Hu and David Linz, two postdocs in the lab who joined the lab as experts in tribolium castanium development, in particular in the formation of wings and the origin of wings in tribolium and insects 
in general. Work by David and Yang Gong demonstrated, uh, and so did work by others, that if you interfere with the master regulator genes that underpin wing development, for instance, vestigial, you don't just compromise the formation of wings, you don't just lose wings in uh, the adult, but you also compromise the development of other structures, such as the carinated margin or the pleural plates in the first thoracic segment. Subsequent work showed that these structures, their formation is underpinned by much of the same gene regulatory network that is responsible for the formation of wings in the second and third thoracic segment, except that in the first thoracic segment, they produce structures that have, on the surface, look nothing like wings. In fact, if you then transform the first thoracic segment through the knockdown of this Hox gene, sex combs reduced, this has been known for a long time. You can induce the formation of ectopic wings in this region, but if you ask how these ectopic things form, you see that it's both the carinated margin and the pleural plates that grow out, fuse, and produce these ectopic wings, wings in the wrong place. So this suggested that carinated margin and pleural plates, even though they look nothing like um, bona fide wings, are nevertheless serially homologous to them. In fact, subsequent work suggested that serial homologous tissues exist not just in T1, in the first thoracic segment, but in every single one of the abdominal segments as well. I'm telling you all this because it motivated the hypothesis um, that maybe, just maybe, thoracic horns could also represent T1 wing serial homologs. All right, how are you gonna test that? Well, the first thing we did is we knocked down some of the most uh, best characterized uh, wing regulatory genes, wing regulators, such as vestigial. And when we do that, this is a control injected individual. Here's a normal thoracic horn, and here is a thoracic horn that has gone poof. Uh, we've done that, we did that with, with vestigial. Apterus, same result, horn disappears. Disheveled, thoracic horn disappears. Uh, abrupt, a major regulator of wing development, at least in the fly, has the same effect. So that really amazed us. Uh, we also looked at uh, hypomorphic knockdowns that created partial losses of thoracic horns. And when we do that, I know it's a little hard to see in these images, but when we do that, we, we find that thoracic horns aren't just completely eliminated, but they are reduced to paired vestiges. I know it's a little hard to see, but just take my word for it. And that raised the possibility that yes, even though we have many species where thoracic horns are medial structures, in development, they could have easily started out as paired bilateral structures that then fuse medially. And then Yang Gong and David came up with this killer experiment, which just completely blew me away. Um, uh, I told you earlier that it's been known for a long time that knockdown of the Hox gene, SCR, sex comes reduced, induces ectopic wings in the first thoracic segment. And so it does in our beetles too. We get these, these beautiful extra set of elytra that are forcing themselves out of the first thoracic segment. Note also that at the same time, the thoracic horn is lost, lending further confirmation that you can either do one or the other. But the two processes could still be decoupled from each other. It's not the final proof that Prothoracic horns are really serial homologs to T1 wings. So what Yang Gong and David came up with is the following. They knocked down the gene paneer. And paneer is a major regulator of structures that form along the midline of the animal. So if you knock down paneer, the thoracic horn disappears. There should be a projection here, but there isn't. But the important thing about paneer is it leaves wing development unaffected. Wings form normally. All right. The idea now was if the tissues that normally produce thoracic horns also fuel ectopic wings, if we replicate the SCR RNAi knockdown in a paneer RNAi background, the induced thoracic, prothoracic wings should now be much smaller because they have less source tissue to work with. We just eliminated the thoracic horn. And that's exactly what we found. So we, again, can induce some ectopic wing formation in a paneer RNAi background, but it is consistently much smaller. 
And so the last thing we did um, is a, and collectively this supports the hypothesis that the same tissue that builds horns in wild type individual also generates ectopic wings in SCR RNAi individuals. Or in other words, that they're serial homologs of each other. Okay. The last thing we did was a heroic uh, RNA-seq effort where we characterized the transcriptional repertoire of various body regions, known or presumed wing serial homologs, as well as structures where we were certain they aren't. And I don't want to walk you through the details here, but I want to walk you through a gradient. When we ask just about vestigial expression, vestigial is this master regulator or generally broadly accepted master regulator of wing formation. We find that wingless, wingless vestigial expression is shared among all known or presumed wing serial homologs. If we think something is a wing serial homolog or know it is, it's got to have vestigial. When we then broaden our analysis to 41 wing genes, genes implicated by the literature in wing formation in at least some insects, we find that wing serial homologs, some of them still group with each other, others fall away. And then if we look at all over 4,000 genes that were expressed across these tissues, we lose any kind of clustering corresponding to wing relatedness. So what this tells us is that these findings suggest that serial homology may be evident on the level of core regulators, if you focus in on those, but very quickly gives way to the establishment of structure-specific transcriptional landscapes that then allow region-specific uh, structures to emerge developmentally. All right, so what have we learned? We have learned that the evolution of thoracic wings was initiated through the repurposing of wing serial homologs, and we speculate that wing serial homologs function as developmental genetic starting points around which structure-specific transcriptional repertoires become established and they enable much of the innovation seen in this body region. That includes horns, as in our beetles, but also we hypothesize the helmets of tree hoppers, the projections of lace bugs, and these winglets, winglets of um, fossil paleodictyopters. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit and move on to the developmental evolution of sexual dimorphism, the development, developmental evolution of environment sensitive development. And I'm going to explore these together because um, I want to convince you that they are actually in many ways um, more similar than they sometimes appear on the surface. But let me step back and first motivate why we do this. Why are we interested in these questions? Well, sex differences and environment sensitive development are responsible for a large portion of intraspecific variation in populations. If you find two individuals and they look different from each other, chances are it's one or both of these factors that contribute to these differences. Both dimensions interact in development and evolution. Sex differences uh, often depend on nutrition or more extreme in well-fed individuals. Um, and not all parts of an organism are equally influenced by sex or environment or nutrition. Instead, these dimensions vary by tissue type and trait. Individual organisms are mosaics of structures that differ in the degree to which they care about sexual identity, nutritional conditions, or broadly environmental circumstances. Uh, here I have the absolute privilege of having been part of a large group of scientists uh, that have contributed to that over the years. Chris Ledenredic, Teya Kijimoto, Eduardo Tsatara are all postdocs uh, associated with the lab. Uh, so is Anna Makanya and Emily Snellerud. Sophia Casaza is a former graduate student in the lab. I also want to highlight Karen Catheter and Germi Roca, uh, two kick-ass statisticians without whom the early stages of uh, this research program would never have materialized. All right, uh, I wanna emphasize we are the only group uh, that works on these organisms in this fashion. So they're very, there are no pre-existing resources. Everything has to be generated by us. So we had very humbling uh, beginnings with EST sequences and uh, custom microarrays. And now, of course, we RNA seek the heck out of everything. Uh, and we also have a, a uh, fully sequenced genome for the species that uh, we most 
frequently used on Pythagoras' Taurus. Um, these efforts have generated tons of insights and resources, but uh, what I would like to jump to very quickly is it has generated wonderful, wonderful candidates to work with. Uh, candidate genes and pathways that may be involved in sex bias development, in nutrition sensitive development, or that may serve as nexus points integrating the two. And I wanna show you two such examples. The first one is the gene double sex. And if double sex is something you've never heard of before uh, or don't think about every week like we do, all you really need to know is that it's a transcription factor. It's a well-studied regulator of somatic sex differentiation in insects. So it's responsible for turning a genitalia into testes in males and ovaries in females. And it has an interesting molecular biology because it's a single gene, but it's al alternatively spliced into male and female specific isoforms. There's one of each in the fly. There's two in the bee, uh, in females, one in males, and there's a non-functional one that is shared between the sexes. Uh, in Bombex, it's similar. In our beetles, it's a little more complicated. We have five female-specific isoforms, and then one in males, and then a one that is non-functional and shared across the sexes. All right. When we knock down uh, the male isoform of double sex, uh, and what I'm showing you here uh, are images of low nutrition control injected males and high nutrition control injected males. And note how these horns in these large males are like 10 times larger than these little rudimentary horns in uh, low nutrition individuals. When we knock down the male isoform of double sex, we largely eliminate nutrition responsive development in males. And that holds up quantitatively very nicely. And um, that was super exciting because it suggested that double sex may not just play a role in making males different from females, it may also play a role in making large males really different from small males. Okay. When we replicated this experiment in females and now knock down the female isoform of double sex, and here you need to know that large females basically look like proportionately enlarged versions of small or low nutrition females. There's no nutrition dependent dimorphism. We have the opposite effect. We induce the nutrition dependent expression of horns. In small low nutrition females, we get little points. In large high nutrition females, we get disproportionately larger horns. They're not as big, of course, as the horns in big males, but they're still a, a disproportionate response or a, a response by nutrition interaction. And again, that holds up very nicely quantitatively. And we also see dramatic effects in different species. Here's just one example. This is Antophagus sagittarius. Antophagus sagittarius is unusual in so many ways. And one of those is that males in this species have lost the expression of horns and the back of the head. And the figure Sagittarius is part of a clade where it's unambiguous that males should be possessing a pair of horns in the back of the head, but Sagittarius has lost that. Instead, what they have gained is the expression of these more moderately sized horns in the front of the head. And um, they're not particularly spectacular. They're just in a weird place. No one else does that. When we now knock down the male isoform of double sex, all of a sudden, this ancestral character state reappears. There was no way for us to predict that. It was like, you can imagine the first individuals that showed up, we were just completely floored. Clearly here, double sex has acquired the function of suppressing the ancestral character state. And when we lift that suppression, we get the emergence of paired posterior head horns. Okay, work by other research groups has since confirmed that double sex may be a common mediator of nutrition dependent exaggeration of secondary sexual traits. Uh, here is uh, work highlighted by Ito et al on rhinoceros beetles, uh, corresponding work on stack beetles. Look at this animal. That is just the most, I mean, blow this up to the size of a dog or like a cow and that would just be, it's insane. Anyways, in all of these, double sex plays a major role in the nutrition-dependent exaggeration of secondary sexual traits. But I still want to highlight an important difference, and that is 
horns in our beetles are not just exaggerated, they're also polyphenic. That is, we have a critical body size threshold below which horns are essentially absent or very rudimentary. And it's only above this threshold that we get the dramatic exaggeration of horns. So double sex alone may be able to explain that exaggeration, but by itself, it is hard to envision how it can generate a threshold response like this. And here I want to introduce you to the second candidate, and that is uh, the hedgehog signaling pathway, which showed up in multiple contexts uh, in our various RNA-seq studies. Uh, the hedgehog signaling pathway, again, is if that is something you don't think about every day, all you really need to know is that it's a really well characterized um, signaling pathway in the context of determining anterior posterior polarity. So it is the hedgehog signaling pathway that determines what part of the wing is going to be the anterior portion and where that boundary is going to lie that then will give rise to the posterior portion. And when we first saw evidence that the hedgehog signaling pathway shows up prominently in our transcriptional profiles, I was absolutely certain that what it does is subdivide the head into anterior and posterior regions and or maybe subdividing the horn into what is the front of the horn and what is the back of the horn. Turns out I was, uh, of course, completely wrong. The hedgehog signaling pathway has nothing to do with anterior posterior polarity when it comes to horn formation. Instead, it has everything to do with the regulation of size. And it does that in a way that is entirely opposite to the way double sex regulates size. Um, so let me explain that because I'm sure right now I'm about to confuse you. So let me show you some data. The first gene we knock down is patched. Patched within that pathway functions as an inhibitor. So if you knock down an inhibitor, the result is the constitutive activation of the pathway, right? Now the pathway is active in everybody. And what happens? Large males lose their horns. That was weird. Then we knock down smoothened. Smoothened is positioned in the pathway in such a way that it acts as an activator, right? So if you knock down an activator, you now shut down the pathway in all individuals. We shut down the pathway in all individuals and small males make big horns. That was crazy. We see the same effect when we knock down hedgehog itself, which is also an activator. It's much more subtle though. So this tells us that the hedgehog pathway regulates size rather than position and that it actively inhibits horn growth in low nutrition individuals. It is not like low nutrition individuals are somehow not able to make horns. Instead, they're actively prevented from doing so. So collectively, this of course now begins to suggest a model for the stepwise evolution of complex allometries that begins with linear allometries that then through the recruitment of double sex uh, evolve in exaggerated trait expression, which can then become sigmoidal or biphasic through the added recruitment of heterox signaling as a nutrition dependent inhibitor of horn formation. Uh, we are, of course, not done. We are now asking how do these pathways interact with other pathways? How do they actually know what the nutritional status is uh, of a given individual? How do they know that they're working in the horn and not in the leg or in the genitalia? How do they know that they're working in males and not in females? Uh, this is the currently most complex model that we have. I'm not going to walk you through it, but just know that this is a continued work in progress. All right. So before I want to move in, move on to the final part of my talk, I want to emphasize that uh, we are also asking not just how do these different morphological traits interact with each other during development, but also we are interested in how trait integration is achieved, for instance, in the context of morphology and behavior. Clearly, these traits, horns, sexual dimorphisms, etc., only make sense, only function if properly coordinated. It doesn't make sense for a small hornless male, for a small male to develop horns and fight. It doesn't make sense for a female to express male-like courtship behavior. These things have to go together. But exactly how these things are coordinated and integrated during development remains fairly poorly understood. Uh, 
here we have had two pilot uh, research programs going on. One has looked at the role of double sex, not just in the development of morphology, but also in the development of behavior. And we find that it has consistent measurable effects on male aggression, really surprising. And uh, we just finished part two of a, a similar investigation into the serotonin signaling pathway, where we can again show it doesn't just affect the development of morphology, but also affects more specific behavior. And here the kicker was that it does so differently in different populations, populations that have historically been exposed to high or low levels of male-male competition, suggesting that evolutionary changes in serotonin signaling could also play a role in microevolutionary changes in um, morphology and um, behavior in our organisms. All right, but what I would like to move on for my last part, uh, oh, let me summarize. What have we learned? We have learned that uh, there are mechanisms that we're beginning to identify the mechanisms that underlie the regulation of trait size as a function of nutrition and sex. We're also beginning to identify pathways that serve as points of integration. We're also beginning to gain an insight into how this machinery is evolving among close related species and what I haven't had a chance to show you also on the level of populations. And we're now exploring pathway interactions that enable different types and degrees of responsiveness in different traits from brains to genitalia to behavior. All right. So what I would like to end with is um, this part here. I want to explore how we study innovation through team building and innovation via environment engineering. And this is work uh, where I'm part of a larger team involving my microbiology colleague, Irene Newton, graduate students, Eric Parker, uh, former grad students, Daniel Schwab and Sophia Casaza, as well as current graduate student, Josh Jones. And here I want to introduce you to the Ontophagus microbiome and the role of co-development and niche construction in horned beetle Evo Devo. All right, so what am I talking about? Uh, let me step back and reintroduce my study organisms from a different perspective. All right? And everything you've heard about today, uh, of course, focused on horned beetles. And that is true, all the beetles we work on are horned beetles, but they also happen to be dung beetles. That means they, uh, rely on dung as a food source throughout their entire life cycle as larvae and as adults. In fact, the way these guys reproduce is that adults fly to a dung pad, they dig into it, and then they dig tunnels underneath the dung pad. And once they reach a certain depth, they then pull pieces of dung down that tunnel and shape those into what we call a brood ball. And into each brood ball, they build at the top end a chamber into which they have deposit one egg, and then they seal it, and then they make the next brood ball. And so you get this row of brood balls in a tunnel. Egg hatches into a larva, and the larva starts consuming the brood ball. And in fact, the brood ball is the sole amount of food the larvae have available to complete all of their development. Okay. Now, the important thing for you to recognize is that dung is a really crappy diet. It is poor in amino acids. It is uh, has high concentration of complex polysaccharides. I think of it as food uh, that someone else already ate. Uh, and at the beginning, it was already pretty difficult food to digest the grasses. So how do you deal with such a challenging diet? Well, here's one answer from my former postdoc, Eduardo Zatara. It takes courage and guts uh, to eat crap all your life. And that's certainly true. These guys have an extraordinarily long and complex gut that they uh, require. What you're looking at, I should say, is a, an eviscerated larva that has its complex gut uh, displaced outside its body. But it probably takes more than that. And here I want to convince you that mothers provide for their offspring more than genes and more than food. Um, I don't know how well you can see this, but the egg actually isn't positioned into that chamber directly. Instead, it sits on a little pedestal. Uh, and that pedestal is made out of mom's own fecal matter. Uh, it's like a fecal pallet onto which she deposits the egg. So she first takes a dump and then puts the egg on top and it balances on there. And when that egg hatches into a larva, the first thing that larva eats is that pedestal. Right. And we now know that 
in doing so, it inoculates itself with a complex microbiome. This microbiome is thereby vertically transmitted from mom to larva, and it is distinct from the microbiome that you find just in dung or in the brood ball or in the surrounding soil. It's its own thing, right? And so first we wanted to know, does it matter? Do the larvae actually care about the microbiome? And here we take advantage of the fact that we can create artificial brood balls in the lab in which larvae can develop perfectly, happily, and complete their entire life cycle. We can standardize this. And now, of course, we can uh, give them a pedestal or not, or swap it around, or do all sorts of interesting manipulations. All right. So First question, does the microbiome enhance fitness? The answer is yes. Uh, animals that are given a maternally derived microbiome, microplus, develop faster than individuals that don't have it, and they also arrive at larger body sizes. Microplus, larger, micro minus, smaller. Uh, next question, uh, are we sure it's about the microbes? Because maybe there's just some awesome nutrient in that pedestal, some superfood. Uh, yes, we are certain because you can actually take that pedestal, you can plate it on various plates, grow up the microbes that live on those plates, scrape them off, dilute them appropriately, and return them to a microbiome-free larva. And when you do that, you rescue the negative effects. So pedestal-inoculated larvae, again, develop faster than soil-inoculated or those receiving no inoculate. And they also come out larger than all the other treatment groups. So yes, artificial inoculation restores novel development. It is the microbes. Is microbiome function dependent on conditions? Uh, for instance, stress. Um, uh, you might appreciate that uh, we didn't ask that question until we had a malfunction in one of our incubators and we got serious temperature fluctuations. And now all of a sudden, only those survived that actually had their microbiome. We then replicated that in a more um, uh, a standardized manner. When we, ex uh, when we expose larvae to desiccation stress, we find that even without stress, your microbiome makes a difference, but with stress, your microbiome uh, makes all the difference. Only microbiome plus larvae survive. And the same is true when we impose temperature fluctuations. Yes, you do better, with your microbiome even under constant temperatures, but you do the, that difference grows if you add stress. Are different host species adapted to host specific microbiomes or do different dung beetle species all converge onto the same gut microbiome? This is work done by Eric Parker who swapped the microbiome by swapping the pedestals across two congeneric species, the Lantophagus. And when he does that, he finds that uh, larvae inoculated with their own or self microbiome do much better. They develop faster, they get bigger than when they're inoculated with the microbiome from their congener. And some of these effects uh, persist into the second generation, consistent with non-genetic vertical transmission of microbiota. And the same holds true for survival. Having the microbiome for another species is, is a real bummer and uh, your likelihood of dying uh, increases. Okay, is it all about nutrition or does your microbiome maybe function also in other contexts? Um, here I would like to remind you that these guys develop in soil surrounded by poop and there is an extraordinary diverse fungal fauna with which they're interacting. Uh, these are all fungal morphotypes cultivated from the soil that surrounds brood balls. Many of them are absolutely beautiful and stunning, and they will kill you if you give them a chance. So what I'm showing you here is the pupa of Ontophagus nigroventris, um, and 48 hours later, that same pupa was turned into a fungal farm by the infection of a entomopathic fungus. So this can be extraordinarily fast and efficient, but the probability of this is lessened if you're inoculated with your maternal microbiome. So here are survival curves or uh, death curves. The red shows the proportion of dead individuals that were inoculated with their maternal microbiome. Green is 
animals that were inoculated with a random field microbiome, and then those in blue have had no inoculation at all. Clearly, having access to your maternally derived microbiome lessens your probability of succumbing to fungal attacks. All right, as if this wasn't already complicated enough. In the two minutes I have left, I want to introduce you to the work of Chris Ledenreddick and Eric Ragsdale. Uh, it turns out, I did not know this until just a few years ago, I just thought that the nematodes that we find on our beetles are just there and don't do anything special. But it turns out that many nematodes have their life cycle faithfully synchronized with beetles. Uh, their dower larvae, when the beetle is an adult, they become reproductive when the beetle is an egg or a larva and do whatever it is they do. When the beetle turns into a pupa, they become a dower again, and then they hang on to the adult when it leaves. In fact, we learned that different nematode species have specialized on different body regions of the adult to hang out as dower larvae. So we have one nematode species that hangs out underneath the wing covers, the elytra, and we have another one that hangs out uh, on the male copulatory organ. Uh, this is the male copulatory organ everted from a male, the adiagus. And here I'm showing you a, a dissected adiagus. And if my technology works, haha, here is a little video of this male copulatory organ. And those are all uh, stressed out nematodes that don't know what the heck is going on because their um, morphological niche has just been destroyed. So these things hang out on the male copulatory organ. And uh, uh, this is what the nematode looks up. It looks like in close up. Uh, Diplogastrellus monohistroides. It has a tooth uh, up here that our nematode specialists tell us uh, probably suggests that it's a bacterial predator. Um, I thought this is crazy and not representative of anything uh, beyond dung beetles, but I was wrong again. It turns out that associations between nematodes and insect brood chambers are actually really common, from bumblebees to stag beetles to termites. Uh, they have been well described. Just functional interactions, if any, have yet to be discovered. No one knows what, if any, impact they have on each other. All right. Uh, so Chris went ahead and developed a method that allows us to rear nematode three uh, larvae and then inoculate them with the nematodes of her choice. Long story short, she finds three major results. The first one is nematodes are transmitted horizontally during copulation and vertically during oviposition. So if you have a female that is infected with nematodes and you mate her with an uninfected male, he will now acquire that. As such, it functions basically as a sexually transmitted disease, if you will. And they're also passed on during oviposition onto the eggs. But it's not a disease. Larvae inoculated with specialist nematodes show improved growth. They get larger. They grow faster. And this is paralleled by consistent changes in bacterial and fungal communities in the brood ball. Now, that is an association. We just see it consistently be associated with the presence or absence of these nematodes, but it hints as a potential functional, uh, at potential functional interactions because the bacteria that are changing, or the bacterial taxa that are changing uh, their relative abundances, many of them have been described in other contexts to be involved in biomass degradation. So you can create a story whereby the presence of the nematode biases the bacterial community in favor of com community members that then the developing larvae can take advantage of. Okay, so what have we learned? We have learned that the ontophagus microbiome promotes host growth, especially under stressful conditions. Beetle hosts and their microbiome reciprocally construct each other's developmental environments. And with respect to the nematodes, I did have a nice summary, but then, um, Ed Young, who wrote, I don't know if he's known in Germany, but he's very well known here, and I highly recommend this book, I Contain Multitudes. It's a fantastic uh, example of science journalism. When he learned about the study, he tweeted the following tweet, quote, dung beetles carry nematode worms in their junk. Those worms pass into the nurseries where the beetles' larvae grow and terraform the environment. The larvae grow faster as a result. It's the circle of life. And, you know, 
can't beat that. All right. More generally, what have we learned? Well, I hope to have convinced you that beetle horns and horned beetles offer a rich and complex microcosmos for exploring the mechanics of innovation and diversification in the natural world. And uh, I want to use this as an opportunity, as always in my talks, to emphasize that we need more people to work on these organisms. My lab is really the only one that works in this fashion on these organisms. But there is so much that can be done. So if you're a graduate student and you're looking for a potential taxon, for a potential project area to work on, consider these organisms. If you're a postdoc and you're looking for a second leg to stand on, uh, consider these organisms. If you're a faculty, and you're just no longer that excited about, I don't know, computational genomics or insect phylogenomics or I don't know, like cichlids, seriously, cichlids, consider these organisms. There are 2,400 extant species in the genus Ontophagus alone. They can't all be wrong, all right. Uh, I wanna end by thanking my many collaborators who made what you've seen today possible. I wanna thank my funding agencies who definitely contributed their part to making what you saw today possible.